Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 7th Karnataka Butterfly and Bee Festival 2023. As part of the festival, we have the expert talks for four days, Monday to Thursday, starting today. The recordings of the previous year's talks are available on the YouTube channel of Bangalore Butterfly Club. Today's talk is by Dr. Krishname Kunte on digital monitoring of butterflies for ecology and conservation. Today, I have the pleasure as well as the challenging task of introducing today's speaker. With the number of fellowships, scholarships, awards received, his professional appointments and professional work, the outreach activities, his articles and publications, and the number of presentations and talks to which he had been invited to give in countries across the world, and many more aspects to Dr. Kunte, covering them all would require me to use a major part of the session. So let me try and introduce to you a gist of his work. With an MSc in Wildlife Sciences from the Wildlife Institute of India and a PhD in Ecology, Evolution and Behavior from the University of Texas, Dr. Kunte is currently the principal investigator of the Biodiversity Lab and the associate professor at the National Center for Biological Sciences Bank, leading a lab group on the diversity, biology and genetics of Indian butterflies. He spearheads the Biodiversity Atlas Indian Citizen Science Collaborative and functions as the chief editor of the Butterflies of India, the Indian Foundation for Butterflies or IFB, also popularly known as I Found Butterflies, one of the longest running modern citizen science platforms in the country. He has authored five books on Indian butterflies and several research papers describing new species and other aspects of biodiversity. He's Earthwatch Institute's Conservation of Species Indian. Fellow for 2020 to 21 and received the American Society of Naturalists 20, 2018 Prestigious, sorry, Presidential Award, Award honoring an outstanding article published in the American Naturalists. He has also oh, been the assistant instructor and teaching assistant at the University of Texas, Austin, and nominated in 2004 for the Best Teaching Assistant Award and awarded the Roger Worthington Fellowship for teaching the class of 2005 to 2006. He has also reviewed manuscripts hey, for several you, research journals and is on the editorial boards of the Current Science, Journal of Research on the Lepidoptera, and Journal of Th Threatened Taxa. He has received, sorry, he has reviewed many funding proposals for different funding agencies in different parts of the world. His photographs have been published in different books, websites, journals and popular media articles. He has given several presentations and talks to which he had been invited in different countries across the world, including Greece, USA, Tokyo, France, Germany, Italy and India at universities, museum, institutes, conferences and workshops. Dr. Kunte has been a wonderful guide and mentor to many who have benefited from his knowledge, encouragement and guidance. So let's go over to a speaker for today and before we do that, before I hand it over to him, I would request all the audience to please keep yourself muted and keep your videos off throughout the talk. And any questions you have can be posted in the chat, which will then be answered by the speaker at the end of the talk. So over to you, Dr. Conte. Thank you, Priya, for this uh, generous introduction. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, can everybody also see my presentation now? Yes. Okay, good. Um, and I hope it's in full screen mode now. It's a pleasure to uh, uh, speak about butterfly monitoring today. Somehow at the beginning of the uh, title, digital was added. I do not know why. It was just butterfly monitoring for ecology and conservation. But anyway, I'm going to actually add butterflies as an indicator taxa because butterflies are not just beautiful, they are also wonderful creatures that tell us something about the environment. And that is uh, one of the reasons why we monitor butterflies. That is why we have been doing it in Bangalore and now starting in many other places. And this is something close to my heart. I was, um, as a young person, the first research project I uh, happened to take up, this was uh, uh, nearly 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, in fact, was about monitoring butterflies for a year. And that project 
uh, essentially led to my entire career uh, in in a few years. So this is something that is very, very close to my heart, not only as a professional, but also as a person uh, going back to uh, being a very young uh, kid uh, back in Pune. All right. So um, as you know, uh, India has a very rich natural heritage. Biodiversity is one of the uh, best uh, resources that we have, natural resources that we have, tremendous uh, amount of species and uh, some very, very uh, wonderful iconic species, including things like king cobras and uh, uh, elephants that India is really famous for. Uh, but apart from that, um, something on the more on the uh, cerebral side, this is something that uh, we should really appreciate quite a bit, which is that India has only about 2% uh, of the landmass, uh, but about 8% of the world's biodiversity. So we do have a substantial uh, uh, portion of the uh, world's biodiversity. Here you have various taxonomic groups shown and the world biodiversity, Indian species, and then the proportion that you see in India. And what you can see is that for things like plants and uh, certain vertebrates, the uh, uh, proportion of world diversity we have is pretty substantial. And generally, we have about 7 to 11 percent uh, of the world's diversity in various groups. In some spe uh, some of these groups, for example, uh, uh, dragonflies and damselflies, we have very high endemism as well more than 70% in uh, certain places such as the Western Guards. So we not only have a lot of species, we have a fairly high endemism, especially in certain uh, groups. And we are among the 17 mega biodiversity countries in the world. We, are we have four globally recognized biodiversity hotspots. And we have a large number of endemics and highly endangered species. Endemism I mentioned, but some of the species that we had uh, shown on the uh, first slide uh, with lots of species, of course, you will recognize many of those species. I only pointed out um, uh, elephants and um, king cobras, but if you get to uh, even smaller organisms such as insects, we still have some very iconic species and some endangered species, especially butterflies, many of which are legally protected. And we'll look at some of those in the next few slides. And the reason why we have so much biodiversity is because India is really um, at the western margin of the uh, world's densest cluster of biodiversity hotspots. So this is a map of, uh, uh, of course, South Asia and then Southeast Asia indo australian region uh, what we call and each one of these purple uh, dashed lines uh, delineates a globally recognized biodiversity hotspot so there are more than 30 globally recognized biodiversity hotspots and of course we have smaller biodiversity hotspots sometimes we also use this term a little bit more loosely but there was a very big global analysis of where you have the maximum number of species as well as uh, pretty high diversity and endemism. So based on that big analysis, uh, these more than 30 uh, uh, globally recognized biodiversity hotspots have been identified. So what you see here are those uh, formally recognized biodiversity hotspots. And as you can see in this entire area, you essentially have one biodiversity hotspot abutting another one. And this just go all, goes on. Essentially, uh, nearly the entire landmass uh, in Southeast Asia is covered under one biodiversity hotspot or another. And the reason why this is so interesting is if you have followed up uh, biogeographic literature and geological uh, uh, upheavals that have happened in this area. There have been rises and falls in the sea uh, level. And then because of that, uh, often these mainlands and islands have been isolated at some point, uh, joined at uh, other points, which has facilitated a lot of movement of species across that, this entire landmass. And of course, uh, there's a lot of marine biodiversity, which shows parallel patterns as um, uh, terrestrial biodiversity does. So this is 
seriously the densest cluster of uh, biodiversity hotspots. And we have four of these. Uh, of course, we have the Western Ghats along with Sri Lanka, Himalaya, uh, and then uh, we have Indo-Burma uh, or Indo-Myanmar hotspot hot where we have northeastern India and parts of uh, Andaman Islands. And then, of course, the uh, um, uh, Malayan one where we have the Nicobar uh, Islands. So um, across every one of these biodiversity hotspots, often we have a completely different set of uh, endemics. And uh, sometimes these endemics are shared across more than one biodiversity hotspots. But many of them do have a substantial endemism, and that is what makes every one of these biodiversity hotspots special, not only for butterflies, also for many other organisms. And as part of this entire biodiversity, we have beautiful butterflies. We have a very high diversity. And uh, of course, there's a great diversity of uh, uh, wind forms, great diversity of behaviors, great diversity of everything, not just species diversity. This is something that we really should appreciate. Often we go for rare species. Often we just uh, focus on species which are stunningly beautiful, but there's a lot of diversity. Uh, in wing patterns, in uh, lavalose plant use, in how species are uh, uh, put together into communities that interact with each other. There's a lot going on in terms of biology. And that is something for me, at least, that's something that just adds more and more layers of why uh, butterflies are so interesting. Um, so in India, we have more than 1,400 species uh, more than 90, uh, 19,000 uh, in the world, nearly 20,000 because every year new, uh, newer and newer species are being added. We have many species which are endemic to India's biodiversity hotspots. Uh, we have a high proportion of species that are habitat specialists. Some of the species are shown here on the right. For example, the Malbar tea nymph occurs only in low-lying evergreen forests. Uh, they're much more common on the western side of the Western Ghats and on the Malbar coast, not so much on the uh, eastern side of the Western Ghats. So really narrow distribution, uh, even within the Western Ghats, you, you have uh, fairly narrow distribution closer to the uh, low-lying areas uh, to the west of the Western Ghats. And then, of course, we have uh, uh, the scarce gesture and the uh, uh, Kaiserihin, Tinopalp is shown here, which again occur in uh, narrow uh, zones uh, in the Himalaya. So they have these climatic envelopes which they occupy, not so much uh, else. So really, really uh, habitat specialists that are valuable for conservation. And then we also have many species which uh, thrive on a very narrow range of temperatures, altitudes, and other climate envelopes which make them vulnerable to effects of climate change or any kind of dis disturbance, really. Each one of these species depends on a very narrow range of lavalose plants, without which they cannot survive. Sometimes some species uh, feed on just a single lavalose plant. Other times they might feed on multiple lavalose plants, but within a single genus. So the amount of chemical uh, diversity that these caterpillars can handle in their lavalose plants is still fairly narrow, even if they might feed on multiple lavalose plants. And that makes them really uh, uh, narrow specialists on plants on which they feed. And later on, uh, we can talk more about uh, this important aspect, if you like, uh, which I'm emphasizing, especially because we have multiple people in the audience today who know a lot about lavalose plants, uh, not just me, but uh, there's Nitin Kautankar, who is doing a wonderful job compiling all the observations on lavalose plants and, of course, curating all the pages of uh, nectar plants and uh, lavalose plants on the Butterflies of India website. So later on, we can uh, uh, answer a few questions if you have any. Okay. Um, why are butterflies such excellent indicator species? I mentioned that butterflies are not only beautiful, they also are excellent indicators of the health of the environment. And this is because uh, they are indicators of the overall uh, invertebrate biodiversity. If you go to, go to an area and see pretty high uh, butterfly diversity, very likely uh, that is indicative of uh, 
great biodiversity of other kinds for example moths beetles and many other invertebrates as well as vertebrates their diversity patterns will overlap with that of butterflies so butterflies are really indicator taxa for uh, invertebrate biodiversity on the whole then uh, your species networks plant animal uh, host uh, parasite networks, uh, nectar plants and lavalose plants is something that we talk about often. Less frequently, we talk about um, how caterpillars or butterflies especially act as hosts for a lot of parasitoids. Parasitoids are these really tiny wasps and flies which uh, unfortunately parasitize, parasitize butterfly eggs and caterpillars. And then these wasps and flies come out of uh, these. Now, that might be sad for us, but what that indicates is that butterflies are not just, uh, they don't exist in isolation. There's very tight relationships that they engage in, not just with plants, also with uh, parasites uh, that feed on butterflies. And parasitoids is a very special kind of a parasite. In fact, there may be more species of parasitoids than there are uh, species of butterflies and all those parasitoids uh, essentially uh, depend on butterflies. So butterflies form this linkage between all kinds of life forms and they do um, uh, they are part of these uh, multi-trophic interactions is what we call it meaning uh, plants which are producers if you remember the um, uh, pyramid that we have learned in schools and colleges you have plants at the bottom and then you have primary feeders and then secondary feeders, you have predators and so on. So butterflies are a very important link here. So any disturbance in the butterfly communities that you see is really an indication that something is going wrong along this entire uh, species networks and communities, um, which is why they are uh, really indicators of health of habitats and ecosystems. And then more recently, it has come to light that um, uh, all the kinds of biological impacts of climate change that you see, butterflies are excellent indicators of that too. In fact, if you look at the history of our understanding of biological impacts of climate change, these became uh, more and more um, clear, more and more obvious, starting about uh, 40 to 50 years ago. And the reason why this was uh, clear was because of all these crazy butterfly watchers, which were going out uh, uh, 70, 80 years ago, some of them uh, uh, going back even further and collecting information on when butterflies come out, when is the first butterfly appearing, especially in colder climates where there's a, a reproductive dipause. So butterflies go to sleep either as pupae or uh, caterpillars or in other stages. And then when uh, temperature becomes, you know, temperature increases a little bit after winter, then butterflies would start coming out. So especially in cold areas, it has been studied for a long time. When does the first butterfly appear? When does the first individual of a certain species occurs? Uh, so these kinds of uh, pieces of information had been collected by a lot of naturalists uh, over the decades when uh, butterfly monitoring was happening. And in fact, because uh, of that, uh, naturalists of all kinds, not just professional biologists, but also naturalists who were closely following butterfly populations within their areas, started to see that climate was affecting uh, butterflies. And of course, this is something that all of you will know because this is quite well-known thing. And uh, all of you as nature lovers, have followed up what is happening with climate change. The Earth's uh, uh, temperature has been rising uh, over the last 100 years. We have fairly good data. And then associated with that, you see changes in how population dynamics of butterflies uh, have altered, right? So uh, butterflies and, of course, birds, these were the two main groups in which uh, biological impacts of climate change were understood for the first time. Now, if you look at other kinds of insects, plants, uh, many other uh, groups of organisms, you see similar patterns. But birds and butterflies were the early indicators that there was something happening in the environment. So you will see that watching butterflies, is, of course, is uh, tremendously pleasurable. 
Yeah, everybody loves butterflies, which is why you're here. So watching it is absolutely superb. And if you have a nice group, such as what we have in uh, Bengaluru, then uh, watching them becomes even more fun. But the activities that we do, the kind of information that we collect has global uh, implications for how uh, we preserve biological diversity in the long term. Uh, anyway, apart from climate change, uh, there are also habitat and biodiversity management practices uh, in Bengaluru area. For example, you know that Forest Department is trying to improve habitat at Dorasinipalya. And we are also uh, requesting them to try to plant more lavalos plants and nectar plants in places where habitats have been degraded a little bit. So if you want to know whether these management practices are actually having an effect, are actually improving uh, situation for butterflies, we really need to start collecting data, uh, long-term data on uh, uh, butterflies, which is indicative of what's happening in their uh, habitats. But understanding whether these management practices are uh, successful, if not, what kind of changes need to be made, is, that is something that we really need to understand in India. Uh, these kinds of studies have been going on for decades now in certain parts of the world, such as North America and uh, uh, Western Europe. But we have a much bigger biodiversity, butterfly diversity here. Uh, we, in fact, have more than twice the number of butterflies you will see in most part of uh, uh, the U.S. Um, our cities, such as Bengaluru itself, has more species than entire nations in uh, Western Europe. So we have a very large butterfly diversity. As I mentioned, many legally protected species, globally endangered species, but we have very little information on most of these species. Most of the information we currently have is from efforts such as our, uh, our Butterflies of India website. And I will also talk about the Indian Butterfly Monitoring Scheme towards the uh, end of this talk. All right, so we can understand all these impacts uh, that are uh, all the changes that are happening in the habitat and how that is affecting butterfly biodiversity as well as other kinds of biodiversity by monitoring uh, their populations in the long term. And by long term, we mean at least five years. Yeah, A lot of times people think that you can do this for a year and then you are done. Uh, you cover all the seasons, which is good enough sometimes. But if you want to understand long-term dynamics, you really need to do this for multiple years. I'll give you an example. When uh, Rohit uh, Girotra, who is uh, the audience, started counting butterflies until 2015-16, population uh, sizes were going down every single year. I think especially from 2013 to uh, 16. Uh, the numbers were going down. And then everybody started panicking based on these numbers, saying, what is going on? Uh, are, uh, is, is this effect of climate change? Is this effect of uh, urbanization in Bengaluru? And there were a lot of reporters trying to ask me whether all of this was some indication of how things are going wrong. And as a scientist, I couldn't really bring myself. It makes sense that, yes, there would be some impacts on po uh, butterfly density, uh, butterfly population density and diversity. But we really didn't have any information. And I did notice that the monsoons were not that great between 2013 and 16. And sure enough, 2017 was a very good year. Uh, the monsoon was on time. Uh, there was a lot of uh, good rain. And 18 also, I think, was so after 17, we have seen rise in numbers once again. And in fact, 19 and 20 uh, were probably uh, way more diverse than others. So if you look at these really long term trajectories of how butterfly populations are doing, you will see that climate, uh, climatic factors, whether rainfall is good or not, how hot is the uh, monsoon and I mean, how hot is the summer? These things do matter for these butterfly populations. And then what you want to know is what are the climatic uh, fluctuations that happen in the long term? understand what how butterflies uh, butterfly populations also respond to that and then beyond these five year trends 10 year trends then we start to see what is above uh, what is the variation that is explained above climatic variation that is going to be the impact of changes that are occurring in uh, their environment 
All right. So these are fairly complex things. And we do want to understand these because without understanding these trends, you can't really uh, help butterflies persist in an area. For any kind of management strategy, for any kind of management intervention, you need good data. So uh, what are the kinds of uh, things that people have uh, looked at so far? Now, of course, I could give you a lot of uh, examples from outside, which are much better studied. But I'm going to try to uh, do this with some of our species. And we would, of course, like uh, a lot more information on these in the next uh, uh, few years and decades. But if you look around, um, we have some excellent indicators of things like uh, rainforests in the Western Ghats. So these are all uh, low-lying evergreen forests, typically under 1,000, 1,200 meters, where the rainfall is pretty intense. And uh, in these evergreen forests, you have tremendous diversity of butterflies. Malbar tree nymph is something that, I, how, that I've already spoken about. You see this butterfly uh, in low-lying areas in a lot of places, but especially you will see them around uh, what are called Myristica swamps. These are uh, highly endangered habitats, uh, again, within the uh, low-lying areas of the Western Ghats and uh, Malbar uh, uh, coast. You have low-lying areas with a lot of um, uh, moisture in the uh, soil. These are waterlogged areas and certain kinds of plants, which are a good proportion of these plants are endemic to these Meristica swamps. And that is a beautiful habitat for uh, these tree nymphs. In fact, if you go to certain uh, areas in Mengaluru or further south into Kerala, you will find these really tall forests. And just like nymphs in uh, a forest, you would see these things just floating around. It's just beautiful. And one of the best places to see them is, in fact, uh, in Karnataka. If you go from uh, Madikeri and other areas uh, in Kut towards Kerala, then on the uh, uh, on the road, you uh, will see uh, this Brahmagiri Wildlife Sanctuary. And just from the road, you will see these beauty just floating around. Really, really wonderful sight. We, of course, have the Malbar Bandit Swallowtail, which is also shown here on the right. These two are... Um, endemic butterflies to the Western Ghats, and again, something that occur only in very, very good forests. Then if you go to uh, the Eastern Himalaya, then you have uh, two species of Bhutan glories. Historically, we only knew one species of Bhutan glory, but now we have this uh, mystical Bhutan glory, which was earlier known only from uh, Bhutan, and in 2007, um, uh, we discovered the population in Eagle Nest, which is the only second population, the only second spot where uh, this mystical Bhutan glory is found. So have lots of these very interesting species, which are just such narrow indicators. And uh, Kaisari Hind, of course, the beautiful green butterfly that I showed you earlier. These butterflies are particularly special because they will they're found only yeah. in this mid elevation uh, range. Yeah. So they have certain uh, uh, okay. temperature and rainfall, I mean, uh, yeah, temperature and rainfall patterns uh, along these climatic envelopes uh, that uh, where you will see these butterflies. And if you want to understand species networks, uh, there's a species called uh, Pieris Devta. The, uh, this is a Ladakhi species. Uh, which is shown here on the right on the flower. So this is uh, a type of a cabbage white butterfly. And I should actually tell you this experience. Uh, when I first went to uh, Ladakh, we saw these hundreds, if not thousands of caterpillars, and there was no butterfly in sight. Only these caterpillars just everywhere uh, on the ground. And as we started observing these and over the next few days and weeks, we observed these uh, caterpillars and pupae. And more than 90% of the pupae uh, that we could get from the caterpillars, instead of butterflies, we had wasps and, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, flies come out of these. And there appeared to be two types of flies. One was a smaller fly and the other one was a larger fly. And this is something that we are studying now. 
Uh, so a large proportion of the population of these butterflies was basically finished off by the parasitoids. Very interesting interaction. Uh, you will see similar type of uh, parasitism even in uh, common butterflies such as plain tiger. And they're also uh, parasitized by flies. Um, so apart from these, what we will call negative interactions between these species, you have some positive interactions. Uh, for example, between nectar plants and butterflies, some of the nectar plants, um, the pollen is carried by butterflies and other pollinators of these species. And uh, among all these networks, you will see this. And again, this is something that we can come back to a little bit later, if you like. Uh, on the right side here at the bottom, you have the raven butterflies and they again feed on a single species of uh, plant in most uh, places um, in these uh, low-lying as well as mid-elevation forests in the Himalaya. Um, okay, so this pollination I've spoken about a little bit. Uh, but butterflies don't go to any uh, uh, flower. Yeah, they are attracted to certain type of flowers, uh, often colorful flowers. But night uh, crepuscular butterflies, butterflies that uh, feed early in the morning and late in the evening, especially uh, late in the evening and sometimes even when it's dark. Uh, for example, the giant red eye uh, butterfly, it actually starts uh, its activity uh, well after sunset when it's almost getting dark that is when this will come out and if you look, uh, see them they largely go to white flowers yeah so uh, different groups of butterflies prefer uh, different groups of nectar plants and some nectar plants such as uh, lantana for example they're just uh, superb attractants to a very large set of species so you have these very interesting uh, differences in larvalose plants and uh, nectar plants, uh, which again changes how butterflies interact with some of these. Um, so daily uh, visits I mentioned just now. And uh, within these, they're fairly sensitive to changes within the habitat. Unfortunately, the next study I'm going to talk about uh, did not take place in India. Um, I have a friend um, uh, called Anuj and Anuj uh, works in Singapore. He did his PhD uh, in uh, Singapore uh, uh, University. Uh, so in uh, NUS, uh, National University of Singapore. So Anuj Jain uh, did a wonderful study. Singapore, as you know, is a habitat, is a, a real oceanic island. Most of it is built up. Uh, but there are a few forest patches still remaining on this beautiful evergreen forest, uh, tropical evergreen forest. But because you have forests and uh, human habitation so closely placed, um, you have certain problems. So what Anuj uh, found out, I just helped him, he was the main person who did this study, is that often these forest butterflies are drawn out of forest because these are small patches on uh, the island of Singapore. So they are often drawn out of forests, and many people have uh, uh, flowers planted in their gardens. So butterflies just keep on moving in the urban areas as they uh, track these uh, flowering patches, and often they can get lost. Yeah, uh, in urban areas. So in fact, in this study, what Anuj uh, tried to recommend is that uh, flowers are planted uh, with some thought in it. Of course, we want to attract butterflies, of course, we want to help them um, feed when they're navigating these very difficult landscapes, such as in urban settings. So it can be good, but uh, it can also be bad depending on uh, how the landscape is organized between natural patches and uh, human dominated patches. So you have all these different things going on and good observations is really what we need. And that uh, is where, again, monitoring comes in. All right. So I'm going to now tell you more detailed uh, insights. I'm going to provide you more detailed insights into what kind of things we can understand by monitoring butterflies. Uh, can anybody quickly tell me what the species is?
I know there are several uh, people who are quite uh, well versed in butterflies, but let's see if there are other people who can uh, uh, guess what this species is. Psyche. Somebody said something. I couldn't hear you. Psyche. It's not psyche. No, it does have these black spots on the forewing. Yes, so good guess. And they are white like psyche, but this is not psyche. Any other guesses? Indian cabbage white. Cabbage white. Cabbage white. Correct. So uh, this is the Asian cabbage white. Here is Canada. And this is a species which is quite common in the Himalaya. We have a population in the Western Ghats as well. If you go to Uti area, for example, you might see this butterfly. Uh, but it occurs in slightly cooler areas most of the time. In the uh, in North India, though, it has a very, very uh, wide range. Uh, so this occurs from about 300 meters to 3,000 meters, which is pretty broad uh, for uh, a cold-blooded insect. And sometimes they can go a little bit uh, about 3,000 meters as well, but typically uh, you will see them commonly uh, up to 3,000 meters. Beyond that, you have other species of Pieris, such as Pieris devata that I mentioned. So um, along this entire gradient, this butterfly faces very contrasting climatic conditions. Uh, the kind of temperature range that you have at the high range is entirely different than what you will see at low ranges. And in fact, this butterfly uh, during winter also comes down up to Delhi and other areas uh, in the plains. So along this entire gradient, it faces very different uh, climatic envelopes. And what you will see interestingly on this butterfly is that it has a uh, different amount of melanization across uh, this entire uh, elevational gradient. So this is something that I had started observing going back to 2007 and 8 when I started doing field work in uh, the Himalaya and Northeast India. So all these are the same uh, butterflies. Here you have uh, the male butterfly. Males have a single large uh, black spot on the forewing, upper forewing. Uh, on the underside, uh, two spots are visible. On the female, you have two large black spots visible. And you will see that females, the base of the wings of the females is much darker compared to the base of the wings of the males. And if you look at the whiteness of the male butterfly, it's much brighter in the male compared to that in the female. Okay. And uh, this, by the way, is work that we eventually did. Uh, uh, I advised a master steward here. Um, uh, and this. Uh, this work is done by uh, uh, him in Himachal Pradesh. I'll uh, speak. I'll talk about exactly what this work was, but this is already a published paper. You can uh, uh, read this work in the paper mentioned there in the uh, bottom left. So what you see here in the center is a winter butterfly, and then on the uh, left you have a summer butterfly, and uh, their upper sides look fairly similar. Yeah. Um, you can't really spot much difference. The underside, again, white uh, uh, forewing looks fairly similar, but you will notice that on the uh, hindwing, they have a lot more uh, melanin, a lot more uh, dark coloration compared to that in the summer butterfly. Yeah, So it makes sense. Butterflies use these dark patches for thermoregulation, for maintaining their body temperature. And therefore, it made sense that butterflies will have this kind of variation. But of course, these were just random observations that I started with. So Shubham uh, Gautam, the student, really wanted to study this uh, with good quantification. So what he did for his master's work is he uh, kept uh, sampling butterflies from 300 meters all the way to 3,000 meters across multiple seasons. And uh, what he did was... In this figure, each, uh, where is my cursor? There. So um, each one of these red spots uh, indicates the point on the wing where he took observations. And at each point, we ask how much melanin is there. Yeah. 
Um, so we measured amount of melanin across this entire elevational gradient. And by the way, he was not only measuring this, he was also looking at the number of butterflies which occur across the entire elevational gradient. And then, of course, eventually we could also make comparisons between winter, season and summer and then lower elevations versus higher elevations. And then, of course, male versus female, because you can very easily see them. Um, OK, and this is what uh, we found out. If you look on the uh, right axis, it's elevation in uh, meters going from 300 to uh, 3000 meters. And then on the y-axis, you have wing melanism. Yeah, So as you can see on this bar, uh, higher the number, darker the wings. OK. And what you see here is, um, let me see this myself. Blue is winter, and then orange is summer. Dashed line is male. Solid line is female. OK. So what you see here is that these are uh, winter females, these are summer females, then you have summer males and winter males, okay? What you can see is that um, there's a big difference in amount of melanism in male butterflies versus female butterflies. Females are much darker. So what random observations I had, uh, this naturalist understanding that I had uh, started to generate Shubham was able to actually put numbers on it and show this with very good information. And this is for upper hind wing. Yeah. So what you will see is that across the entire elevational range, the amount of melanin does not change on the upper hind wing. But if you look at the under hind wing, which, as I mentioned earlier, is critical for thermoregulation. Uh, these butterflies typically sit uh, uh, sideways facing the sun, and therefore they're uh, under hind wing is exposed to the sunlight. So under hind wing is where they absorb uh, heat from the sun. So that uh, wing surface is really important. And there, what you see, there is a relationship with the uh, elevation. So greater the elevation, meaning colder it is, more melanic they are, darker they are. And therefore, at lower elevation, where it's really already hot, they are much less melanic. They are much whiter compared to at higher elevation where they need to heat up a lot faster. Um, and this is a pattern that you will see in summer and winter uh, comparison as well. Really beautiful work. So the reason why I chose this example is that normally when we talk about butterfly monitoring, and as I mentioned in Bengaluru, we ha already have a very good group uh, uh, monitoring butterflies for the last 12 years, nearly 12 years. So just counting is something that we often associate uh, uh, with monitoring, but there is interesting biology and butterfly monitoring should ideally include these kinds of things as well. By the way, we are uh, continuing our studies of Pieris canidia, the Asian cabbage white. So if you're uh, fascinated by any of this work, then I'm really looking for PhD soon. So we'll pursue on this work. So this is something that we are actively pursuing and uh, uh, it will be wonderful if some of you can join our team to study this further. Um, anyway, so I will actually skip this in the interest of time. So this is one of the uh, studies that our lab has published. I will talk about one more uh, case study a little bit later. But since I mentioned the Bengaluru uh, butterfly monitoring, this is something that I want to show you. Uh, this is going to be part of what Viraj is doing, Viraj is a PhD student in my lab. But the data for these are generated by uh, Rohit Girota, and then uh, he did it for 10 years. Since then, Nagesh uh, uh, had uh, monitored this, and now Manideep is monitoring this in Dorisanipalya. So what Viraj has been doing is uh, a large scale comparison of seasonal patterns of these butterflies. What is shown here, the dash, uh, the dotted line here is the average for every uh, single month. This is January to December. And this is our uh, uh, common grass yellow. What you see is that the abundance is much greater after the monsoon. So in the post monsoon, they have the uh, greatest population density and the blue areas here is uh, yearly variation. Yeah, so 
the total variation that you see in post monsoon uh, season is much greater compared to what you see at lower densities yeah there are statistical uh, statistically interesting patterns here but we'll ignore those what you see here is this biologically meaningful uh, population cycle yeah going from really low numbers in the summer to really high numbers post monsoon slowly increasing and then after uh, uh, november as you can see there's a pretty rapid uh, decline in numbers of these butterflies and this again is uh, from data across uh, multiple years i think uh, this was generated from nine or ten years of data but now we have 12 years of data so we have these very interesting patterns uh, going across uh, all these years in different species. Here you have the lemon pansy, and here you will see that there are at least two, potentially uh, three uh, peaks in the population dynamics, meaning that there are three prominent uh, uh, generations of this butterfly, uh, uh, prominent peaks leading across from multiple generations. Uh, here you can see going from the uh, month of May all the way to um, um, August and September, you have steady increase. And that would, of course, be across at least two generations in our, our area. So you have all these very interesting patterns. And then the next interesting question is, why is it that common grass yellow shows one kind of um fluctuation in uh, populations and then lemon pansy shows very different kind of pattern. Here is a third pattern. This is our um, blue tiger. And you will see that it its numbers are uh, the highest in April. Yeah, And about from March to uh, May, the numbers are much higher. And other seasons, uh, they are uh, not that common in Bengaluru area. And of course, the uh, blue area, this yearly variation in the numbers is really high. And that is, of course, because this is a seasonal, uh, seasonally uh, migrating species. So these come, uh, these occur in uh, Bengaluru area throughout the year, but the numbers are out of the roof, especially because of the migratory swarms, which come from the Western Guards. So this is a third pattern. So as you start looking at each one of these species, it starts to make sense why you have certain species showing certain kinds of patterns. So these are the kinds of things that uh, Viraj is uh, working on right now with the long-term population data that we have from Bengaluru. All right, here is another study, and this is interesting. Uh, I'm, in this particular case, I'm just going to talk about one species. And this is the plain cupid butterfly. You have the uh, dry season form shown here, wet season form shown here. The open circles here are the proportion of uh, uh, dry season forms in the population shown here. And the filled squares here is the actual population size shown here on the left side. Okay, So as you can see, the population numbers are really low in the summer. The population numbers are much higher uh, in the monsoon and post-monsoon season. But if you look at the number of dry season forms, uh, the entire population is made up of dry season forms. And then just before the monsoon, uh, the dry season forms go to zero, meaning that the entire population is made up of wet season forms. And then, of course, after the monsoon, um, the uh, proportion of dry season forms rises quite a bit. So this work, uh, the uh, data was collected by Ashish Tiple uh, during his PhD. This was way back in uh, early 2000s, early to mid uh, uh, the first decade of uh, this century. Beautiful work. And Ashish basically just went out every week and counted these butterflies. And then with uh, 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 Deepa Agashe and Ashish, we were able to do this beautiful analysis of what matters to these butterflies. What you see here is this tree-like structure. And um, let's look at this uh, thing on the right. It's um, same kind of analysis. One is for uh, the population size of uh, these butterflies. And this one is for the proportion of dry season forms. Okay. But let's look at this. What it shows here, this is, this is the high level. Yeah, and then this is the lower level of uh, what 
explains the variation. So what this shows is that the first thing that matters for the dry season form and wet season form of these butterflies, if that if the precipitation is less than uh, 0.9 centimeters, then you have a very high uh, 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 proportion of dry season forms. If precipitation is greater than that, then you have a much lower proportion of uh, wet season forms. This is uh, the amount of variation that is um, uh, also explained. And then the after precipitation, humidity really matters. If humidity is uh, lesser than 56%, then you have low numbers. If you have humidity greater than uh, 56%, then you have uh, greater numbers. And then, of course, temperature has a big role. So we were able to look at hierarchically what climatic factors matter for uh, these species. Now, this is just single species in which we have done this, right? Now, imagine if you want to understand what makes butterfly numbers go up and down through seasons and through years, you have to do this kind of uh, analysis to understand what is exactly going on with butterflies. And only these long-term population dynamics will tell you what butterflies are indeed going down in numbers and what butterflies are becoming common. Now, 12 years is a pretty good amount of time over which we have uh, monitored butterflies, but it's still not good enough uh, to understand uh, yearly variations versus long-term dynamics. So at this point, I'm going to tell you something uh, which is understood from population uh, dynamic studies in uh, uh, the UK. That is the longest running uh, systematic population dynamic study, uh, population monitoring study has been going on for more than 47 years. So from these really long time series, from these really long uh, uh, monitoring schemes, what we know is uh, species which occur in open areas, species which occur in disturbed areas, their numbers have slowly been increasing in the UK. And if you look at habitat specialists, there's a heat uh, butterfly. And those occur in very specialized, uh, very sp special kind of uh, uh, grasslands or open areas with a lot of herbs. Uh, these are not technically grasslands. These are uh, more like uh, herbs, herbs that grow in these. So uh, these, these areas are called heaths. So this butterfly is called uh, a heath as well. So that is a habitat specialist and butterflies like that, they have gone down in numbers and things like cabbage whites, for example, have become more common. There are certain other species which occur in open areas. The caterpillars feed on roadside plants. So they have become more common because their habitat has grown quite a lot in the last 47, 48 years in the UK. And this is now on top of the annual uh, fluctuations that you see and short-term fluctuations that you see in these butterflies. This is really where uh, you have value of doing the kind of work that we do, of monitoring uh, populations. So for many years, you have probably heard me uh, almost like a broken record, always saying count, 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 no, uh, keep your numbers, uh, keep a good record. These are the kinds of things that we really want to understand by doing this. So when I told you earlier that butterflies are good indicators, these are the kinds of studies that will show you why certain species indicate uh, certain uh, kinds of changes in the climate. So now you come full circle in terms of understanding why butterflies are such great indicators and what their populations uh, fluctuations might mean. So this is, of course, I gave you specific examples first of the Asian cabbage white and then the plains cupid, but uh, this is something that we want to understand for all species of India, if we can. And of course, rare species, they are seen so rarely that you can't really see what, is, what are the patterns because they're just not seen frequently enough. But for common species, certainly we can hope to have uh, this kind of information um, at a pretty good level. And this is what we want to do. So learning from the experience in Bengaluru plus other uh, monitoring that we have done. So even if I did my first study of population uh, dynamics back in 92-93, uh, uh, I've really uh, uh, developed methods and uh, I've been encouraging people to undertake this kind of studies since 2000. 
2007. Uh, 2007, 8 is when we uh, formalized some of these methods, and I'll talk about this in on later on this slide and on the next slide. But I realized that just like in the UK and parts of Europe, we needed to uh, scale up. Uh, so we really needed to get a, a lot of people interested, not just rare people like Rohit or Nagesh and then uh, others who have started doing this. For example, Arun and Namrataras do this in Mysore. So we want this to be done at a much uh, larger scale, ideally across the scale of the entire nation. And to facilitate this, to encourage this, uh, about three years ago, we launched the Indian Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, IPMS. This is the uh, URL of the website. And we already have multiple locations where this is uh, happening. Of course, we have the longest running uh, monitoring scheme, uh, monitoring study in Bengaluru. Then we have uh, uh, things going on in Mysore. And then this year, we started this in two more uh, cities, Pune and Mumbai. And of course, in uh, uh, Delhi, it has been going on for some time. We need to formalize that and get them uh, in the fold of IBMS. Uh, same with Kolkata. We want to do this in uh, Chennai. We want to do this in as many cities and towns as possible. So if you're interested in doing this, please uh, get in touch with me after this talk and we'll set you up. We have volunteers in a lot of places, we can visit you, train you on how to do this. And we would really like to see more and me more people involved in uh, this particular activity. And I would like thousands of uh, sites where butterfly counting is done, not just a few dozen. For the size of our country, for the size of our uh, human population, we really need to do this at a much bigger scale. All right. Uh, well, so how I'm doing on time? Unfortunately, because uh, I'm full screen, I can't keep uh, time very well. How much time is remaining? It's 8.01. Eight um, other 15 minutes. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So we do 30-minute counts, and there are a couple of YouTube videos about this. So I won't go into the details of this right now, uh, but this entire method is uh, mentioned really well in this paper that published that was published just a few months ago, and uh, the middle author on this. So this, the first author was a postdoc in my lab, Sumana Tivili, who did a wonderful uh, analysis of the data that uh, Nitin and she collected. Uh, this was, by the way, in three places. One of them was Dorasani Pallya. The second one was uh, um, um, Brahmagiri Wildlife Sanctuary that I mentioned earlier. And the third one was, I think, Samandurga. Uh, so we had uh, these three locations where this was done. And um, you can see what the uh, distribution patterns were. But in this first figure, we explain how the traditional transect method differs from the kind of 30 minute counts that you uh, that we do and when we wrote this up in the first uh, review of this paper several reviewers said oh please write more about this because this is confusing we are not clear about that and we wrote up all these things and described this a little bit more uh, did a comparison uh, even more explicit between uh, traditional line transects and our uh, time constraint counts or 30 minute counts. And after it came out, actually throughout the whole world, people uh, started writing to us saying, this is a very nice comparison. We were looking for something uh, like this. And during the review process itself, actually uh, the reviewers pointed uh, out to us that of course we have been doing this for uh, at least 12 years in uh, Bengaluru. And for 15 years in other parts of the country, for example, Northeast, we have been counting butterflies since 2007 using this method. But recently, even uh, uh, European Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, EBMS, has adopted our approach of doing these kinds of time constraint counts. Earlier, they were following the line transect method, but now they're doing third, uh, they're, they're doing 15-minute counts because their habitats are smaller, they have way fewer uh, number of butterflies uh, in any area compared to what we have. 
so there are 15 minute counts, but essentially they are also doing these kinds of time constraint counts. But throughout India, we have been doing 30 minute counts. All our data are uh, standardized for 30 minute counts. And we already have more than, um, I think about uh, two lakh observations from uh, these time constraint counts alone. So more than two lakh observations, imagine that this is uh, one of the largest data sets from tropical areas, uh, especially given that we have fairly good time series. So really, really beautiful work. And this is uh, possible because we have such a large citizen science uh, effort undergoing. Uh, of course, we started with Bengaluru Butterfly Club, but now in different parts, we have different groups doing this, uh, different cities, we have different groups doing this. So this is truly becoming a, a national movement. Uh, of course, we are still small because we have this going on only in uh, four or five species, uh, four or five places on a regular basis. But we do hope to uh, get this into hundreds, if not uh, thousands, in the next few years. Uh, so what you do here is walk along whatever path you have, and then every 30 minutes you uh, uh, consolidate your observation in these 30 minute slots. So when you do not see too many butterflies, uh, you can cover a long distance in uh, this in this time uh, frame. Whereas when you see lots of butterflies, for example, here uh, on this side, where is my cursor here? So here each blue line uh, uh, is beginning and end of a 30 minute count. So in this, you have two 30 minute counts done, whereas you have so much space covered in 30 minute count in this particular 30 minute count, because there's not much here to count, right? Whereas here you have that. So that is the idea behind why we do 30 minute counts rather than uh, traditional transects. And he, as you can see, in certain areas in India, you can see thousands of butterflies, not just a few dozen. Seriously, thousands of butterflies, sometimes of dozens of species. So you cannot really make uh, too much progress if you start in the morning. In fact, I remember back in 2015, this was one of the uh, best trips to Namdafa. Uh, there were eight of us. And every single day, I would decide that I want to go really far, watch as many butterflies as possible, cover as large an area as possible. And on certain days, I couldn't even walk more than 500 meters from morning to uh, late afternoon, simply because there's so many butterflies that you cannot make progress beyond a few tens of meters in half an hour, right? So if you are trying to do your regular transect, uh, the traditional transect, it's just not going to work in really biodiverse habitats such as in Namdava. Or if you have... Uh, 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 if you have a mountainous area, for example, in, um, of course, Namdafa is an example. If you want to talk about South India, if you go to any part of the Western Ghats, you're not going to be able to walk in a straight line, which is required there. So we just go along a trail, uh, or if you find a good mud puddling spot, just spend a lot of time there. And Nitin, uh, Ravi Kantachari, our uh, very own Nitin, he did... Um, all this sampling and of course he was familiar with these things and these are kinds of counts that we take in all uh, kinds of areas now all right i'll stop there i think i've uh, uh, hopefully convinced you that we really need long-term data sets and we need uh, standardized methods uh, so that we can compare our results across multiple years across decades uh, eventually uh, but also in different parts of India. All our data should really be compatible with each other so that we can compare, let's say, what's happening in Dehradun versus what's happening in uh, Bengaluru versus what's happening in, uh, uh, let's say, Dibrugad. Yeah. So we want to have uh, these big comparisons made. This is going to be really important without these kinds of data. We really can't go to forest department saying this is what's happening in our areas and these are the species which need further protection. These are the kinds of habitats which need uh, stricter uh, protection and things like that. So uh, please start this in your area. Again, uh, uh, coordinate with Viraj and I uh, about uh, getting into uh, this whole uh, IBMS network. And that's just going to be, uh, that's going to make things easier 
for you to do this in your area and of course we will have a national effort uh, through which we can understand what is happening with our butterflies so with that i'll stop on the left side you have our lab website uh, at biodiversitylab.org so if you want to read more about the kind of research that i explained today then you can go to this website on the right side of course is our uh, popular uh, butterflies of india website and then you have uh, our research collections website and of course ibms uh, dash network dot in uh, the indian butterfly monitoring scheme website yeah so you can uh, uh, find some of the resources there we have a uh, template uh, to enter uh, count data so that also uh, you can download or we can uh, email that to you and we want to start now listing all the monitoring projects on this website too so there is a lot of work to be done if you would like to volunteer for this uh, just get in touch we'll be very happy if you volunteer and help us uh, grow in this scientific effort which uh, with which we eventually also want to uh, uh, make a big impact on butterfly habitats and butterfly populations so that we'll have butterflies uh, over the long term, not just in forests and other natural habitats, but also in uh, uh, fairly well-wooded uh, cities such as uh, uh, Bengaluru yeah, and Pune and other places. Uh, actually, in Karnataka itself, we have diverse habitats and lots of cities and towns where butterfly habitats are not really very far from where a lot of us live. So if you want to uh, see butterflies in our neighborhoods, in our areas, in the long term, these are the kinds of things that we need to start doing now. So I'll be very happy if you get in touch and volunteer to do these things in your own areas. All right, with that, I'll stop. And if you have any uh, uh, questions, I'll be very happy to address those. Well, we have a couple of questions, sir. Uh, okay. There's one question from Gaurav Soman. Mm -hmm. To be able to comment of, on butterflies as indicators of climate change, mm -hmm. do we need to have data for the past 30 years or can we derive some useful trends from last four or five years? So you can't go back to last 30 years and get it. Uh, there's that. But if you start now, then of course we will uh, soon have uh, that kind of data and in fact it's unbelievable that we already have 12 year long data uh, set from bengaluru and within bengaluru we have uh, uh, collected a lot of data in dorasinipalli of course but also on ncbsg kvk campus and now of course mukund and uh, vasu have started in kalkari as well so we have our third locality under uh, uh, this kind of long monitoring so you should absolutely start now. Four years is better than nothing. Yeah. So if you're four years, I'm going to say, ah, four years is not good enough. You need to do this for 10 years. And if you have 10 year data set, I'm going to tell you that 10 years is not good enough. You need to do it for 20 years. As a scientist, as somebody who wants to uh, have good data to be able to very confidently say what is going on. Now look at this. Uh, I don't have to tell butterfly watchers I don't have to convince butterfly watchers that uh, something is happening with butterfly populations. Certain species require more uh, uh, conservation intervention than others. You already know this, which is why you're here. But if you're talking to forest department, if you're talking to perhaps some city uh, officials, if you're talking to the uh, government, then you need good data set. You need to have very strong patterns, which nobody can deny. In fact, uh, in spite of all the big lobbies for uh, uh, petroleum industry and uh, everything else, and of course, uh, massive governments. If we needed to convince them that climate change is real and we need to do something about it, it has taken us decades uh, to convince all these people, but good data, very clear patterns is what has convinced the world that uh, a climate change is happening and that we need to do something about it. Otherwise, a lot of populations are going to go extinct, in addition to, of course, human suffering. So is four years good enough? 
absolutely is 10 years better absolutely is 30 years better than 10 years absolutely so do the most that you can and ideally just like what rohit did after you have done uh, your bit pass the uh, uh, run to somebody else and somebody else will take this up right? so start with four years and then we'll see uh, what we have but four years certainly is better than uh, no years okay yes sir and before i ask the second question i would request all the viewers to please keep yourself muted so that uh, we do not get any other noise during the speaker's uh, answers thank you Yes. When you are uh, asking question. questions at that time, you can unmute yourself. Yes, yes. So uh, the second question is by Imran. How mm -hmm. about an approach like eBird can be done in butterflies in coordination with the forest department, starting with at least protected areas in Shin? Right. So actually, the uh, IBMS indeed is like uh, eBird where we are collecting uh, data. So it's exactly like eBird in terms of uh, generating data. Right, uh, but it's actually better than eBird. If you think about it, uh, eBird doesn't really have uh, data which can be passed out and duplication uh, avoided. For example, if you look at eBird data, if there's some rare sp uh, species, a uh, rare migrant which comes in, you will see thousands of observations on eBird for that one individual that might have come there, right? So if you just blindly look at the data, you might think that there, the population size here is thousands of uh, uh, butterflies, whereas it might have been just one individual, but there are thousand bird, bird watchers who have contributed data uh, on, on that sighting of one individual. Uh, but also these things are dependent on how many people go out and uh, record birds in certain seasons, in certain areas, and so on and so forth. It's massively important data. This is the best data set we have so far. But IBMS data is better in the sense that uh, it's a much smaller data set as of now, but hopefully it will get uh, as big as eBird data if we have as many as uh, as many butterfly watchers as there are bird watchers. But um, why IBMS type of data set is better is because we have these uh, uh, two weekly counts. So because butterflies are short lived, uh, most butterflies do not live for more than two weeks, maximum three weeks in the field. Uh, many butterflies do not even make it up to two weeks. So when we say what is going on with butterflies, uh, in terms of population dynamics, if we count <laughs> sort of the weeks, we are going to uh, uh, we are going to estimate numbers in every single generation of butterfly, and because these are then uh, highly standardized uh, butterfly counts, the kind of data you get is much better. And of course, not everybody who goes to Doris and Ipalya records data separately. We all uh, tell one person who is uh, uh, taking down data, how many butterflies we see in these 30 minute slots. And because there's no duplication of effort, the kind of patterns that we see are much more reliable compared to eBird kind of data. Now, of course, eBird kind of data is what we have coming from uh, our Butterflies of India website. All the image-based observations that have been put up essentially is that kind of data, uh, which is not systematic. Uh, iNaturalist data is also similar, where people may or may not be able to photograph a butterfly and whatever gets photographed gets put up there. With eBird app, of course, you can also do non-image base, which is also what we do with 30 minute counts. So if we uh, want to build this, this IBMS model is really the way forward. And that is really scientifically more, um, uh, scientifically more robust way of uh, taking down data. So we not only have a, a monitoring program in place, we actually have a slightly more uh, uh, formalized and therefore a slightly better way of collecting data than eBird. All right, next question. Ashok had just put uh -huh. up the uh, link to Indian uh, iPhone butterflies website. So you can go to the website and also see the 
different species pages, uh, early stages, lavalose plants. Yes. All uh, right. Any as of now, these many questions, questions, sir. If anybody would like to unmute and ask a question, you can go ahead. So until then, actually, what I'll do is I'll come out and I will share my screen. And I will, I think, no, not control it. Where is full screen? Okay. All right. All right. So, um, oh, wait. I think I this think is IBM's website. Site, site, site. Yes, if anybody, anybody would like to uh, ask a question, you can unmute yourself and ask. I'm trying to get out of this to go to the... Um, I found Butterfly's website, just a minute. Hmm. And while he's doing so, I'd like the viewers to know that uh, even up the past uh, few years, uh, recordings of all the expert talks are available on the YouTube channel of the Bangalore, Bangalore Butterfly Club channel. So you can have a look at all the previous recordings too. Hopefully this will go there, right, all right. So this is our website, I found butterflies. And what you see here is, oh, just a minute. Okay. So what you see here is that um, uh, our common plain tiger butterfly, and you have uh, an image gallery where you can see kinds of variations. For example, this variation has white uh, underside. This is a male with this particular patch, which is found only in males, and you have females here which do not have those. And then upper side, underside uh, behavior such as mating, all these things are shown. And this is a constantly growing uh, database. Uh, Rohit's observation, this is uh, uh, recent. And these are the kinds of things that we uh, put up. If you look at um, the distribution map, it shows you where this uh, butterfly is found. And as you can see, it is found all over India, except in uh, the Himalayas, uh, in higher areas. So at uh, low and mid elevation, you will see this everywhere, including in desert areas. So these are the kinds of uh, things that we are um, finding out. And this is something that uh, Nitin Kautankar is actively curating right now. These are the Lavalos plants, Calotropis crocera, Calotropis gigantea. So not only do we have images of butterflies, we also have images of Lavalos plants and nectar plants. Here you can see the caterpillar on the uh, lavalose plant. And then this is a different lavalose plant. So you can see what these host plants look like. So if you're looking for um, specific host plants on which you can look for caterpillars, then this uh, tab under the species pages is really, really helpful. Um, and Nitin, slowly we should be linking these two species pages, uh, plant uh, species pages as well. So um, actually, if somebody else wants to volunteer to do this kind of work, then we'll be very happy. That will just make this website even uh, more attractive. If you can just click and then go to uh, uh, plant pages. So anyway, these are kinds of things that we have. So... We are looking forward to growing this further. I'll actually show you what the plant pages look like. So here you go. This is now the plant species page. 
And here you have a whole, uh, you have a list of uh, species which use these as uh, Lavalose plant and Necker plants. Yeah, so for every single plant species now, we have this kind of linkage done between butterflies and plant and as Lavalose plant and uh, Nectar plant. So really beautiful uh, work being done by a very large team. This is not uh, my lab's uh, website. This is everybody's website. Yeah? And everybody should contribute to this. This is really a terrific community resource. And uh, we should be contributing to it as well, not just using it. And kudos to Nitin for doing this. Uh, he's actually sitting in my lab doing these kinds of things nowadays. All right. If you don't have any uh, other questions, then uh, thank you for attending this uh, talk. And I do look forward to seeing some of you start uh, counting butterflies in your areas. Thanks again. Priya and uh, Vasu, back to you. Yes, sir. Uh, another chance for anybody who would like to unmute and ask. Otherwise, we will wind up the session. Anybody would like to ask a question and unmute yourself? Okay. So, so thank you, Dr. Kunte, for the most enlightening talk, showing us how studying and monitoring the butterfly forms and counts tells us a lot about uh, the patterns and the relationships between the environment, the elevation, the humidity, temperature, and rainfall and the time of year too about and the butterflies. And it was also very fascinating to uh, learn about the relationship of uh, the melanin in the uh, wings according to the elevations uh, where the butterfly is found. So overall, it was fascinating to learn a lot of things from the many studies that you have talked about. Thank you for the wonderful talk. And uh, uh, thank you viewers for being here with us and enjoying and uh, making use of this talk. I'm sure all of us will be uh, going through these websites also and learning much more through the, through what you have told us today. And uh, viewers, I also invite you for the remaining talks for the week. We have three more talks in the uh, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Do join us for those two at the same time that is seven to eight and be there with us. And if you want to see the previous year's recordings, like I mentioned before, they're available on the YouTube channel of the Bangalore Butterfly Club. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye, everyone.